If there is one flat earther who knows how to get absolutely everything wrong that he looks at, it's Mr. Thrive and Survive. His lack of understanding when it comes to the sun, the moon, and our dear old earth is something truly to behold. We are going to look at a total fallacy that anyone that can use any little bit of critical thinking can work out in their own mind that there's something big that's wrong here, and it's literally something big that is wrong. That's right, it's the return of Mr. Thrive and Survive, and guess what? He's after NASA again. Hello all, and welcome to another edition of the ever-popular and well-loved Flat Earth Friday. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, I just want to wish Robert Innocentio and his wife, who is giving birth today, huge amounts of luck. They're giving birth to their daughter, Penelope, today. Happy actual birthday, Penelope. I wish the three of you all the luck in the world. Just another friendly reminder about my other channel, Run Man Dan. If you like running and exercise and you fancy checking that out, then please do subscribe. The link will be in the description. Thank you. Right, back to Mr. Thrive and Survive. And some of you may remember that in an older video, I once referred to him as having the intellectual capacity of an empty Marmite jar. After that video, I hopped into one of his live streams where I was promptly blocked for defending myself. After that, he continued his tirade against me. Yes, his, ac his arguments are not scientific. They're ad hominem. He's stupid. What was the stupid as a man man jar, whatever it is. Must be a British term. Yeah, it's Marmite Rich, not Man Man. Can't even get that one right. So recently, Rich released another video about NASA, this time about their big problem. Let's see what he thinks that is. Hey everyone, Rich was for Thrive and Survive. We are going to look at a total fallacy that anyone that can use any little bit of critical thinking can work out in their own mind that there's something big that's wrong here. And it's literally something big that is wrong. And uh, let's get into it and you'll see the fallacy of the eclipses and the sizes of everything that they've been trying to show us and how it just doesn't work. So we've been sort of looking at the uh, sun in a sort of a flat kind of a way, you know, because although we know they say it's a ball, when you talk about 93 million miles away, uh, you get into sort of flat things. And we're going to see that's actually not the way to look at this. I'm assuming Rich is talking about how the light reaches us. The light from the sun does reach us in a, in a parallel nature. That is well known. And it took a guy at uh, ASU, Arizona State University, when we had a flat earth meetup, when uh, Mike Ball was speaking to the uh, planetary astronomer, I think that's what he called himself, uh, he said something It was like a little bell went off my head. It was like, oh, yeah, because when I, I spoke to him just a little bit, and I was trying to show him that you can't, from one light source, make a larger object smaller. I actually showed you that you can do this, Rich, in a previous video. You know, the one I directed towards you? Here it is again for the benefit of the viewers. Grab yourself a light, grab yourself a ball, grab yourself a piece of paper, cast a shadow on that paper. If you move that ball a certain distance away from the paper, the shadow does get smaller. A smaller shadow than the object causing it. Et voila. And he got to talking about how, you know, the sun isn't flat, it's round, and it comes off at all angles. And I'm like, oh... You just killed yourself. You just don't even realize it. So let's take a look at a couple of things that they've been teaching us and see the huge fallacy. Now, when you look up the science of how the seasons are made on the Earth, you always get this. You get parallel rays striking the Earth. And the reason why, for example, 43 degrees is your angle right here at this part of the Earth is because the curve of the Earth is 43 degrees from parallel right here where it strikes at 90 degrees. If the sun came in at different angles, you could never calculate where the sun was on a curved Earth. I think what the person in question was trying to say, Rich, is that light comes from the sun at all angles. However, the Earth is so far away from the sun that by the time the photons reach us, they are travelling parallel. It has to be parallel, and when you do the mathematics, I can't find the calculator. It used to be there. They probably took it down. But if you calculate the light coming off an object... Even a flat object is what I assumed. Uh, at 93 million miles, uh, it doesn't matter, flat or curved, there, I think it's 89.986 degrees 
So virtually parallel, they have to strike. And here's another example. And why is this important? Again, if the, for the seasons to work and actually for you to be able to measure where the sun is in the sky and to figure where your latitude is, the sun's rays have to always strike the Earth parallel. They have to. Does that not prove a spherical Earth then, Rich? Or are you playing along waiting for your gotcha moment? But what do they tell us? All of a sudden, there's a change when an eclipse happens. When an eclipse happens, this is what they show us happens right here. All of a sudden, we have the top of the sun rays suddenly come down, not parallel, but strike the earth here and create this shadow. From the bottom of the sun, they come up, strike the earth here. And this is why, uh, you know, I did a video called The Moon is 70 Miles Wide. And it's because during the solar eclipse, the moon's shadow on the earth was only 70 miles wide. And people will say, oh, oh the partial... Partial eclipse, you have to count that too. No, there's no shadow on a partial eclipse. I'm sorry. The light isn't quite as bright, but there's no shadow. No shadow from a partial eclipse. During a partial eclipse, some of the light from the sun is blocked. Therefore, you get a penumbra. The dictionary definition of penumbra is the partially shaded outer region of the shadow cast by an opaque object. There is no shadow. You cannot see a shadow cross your area when a solar eclipse begins and never you see a shadow unless you're in the total eclipse area. That's when you see a shadow. <laughs> Let's get real and use what we actually observe, shall we? It gets slightly darker during a partial solar eclipse, therefore shadow. But here's the problem right here. You see, no matter how far away the sun is, especially if it's farther away and it's a ball, only the very little teeny part of the sun that faces the earth would ever have those light rays strike the earth. Has to be. If it's up here, it's on an angle going what? Let's see. Out that way. It would never strike the earth. Oh my word. What is it? There's a, some sort of rule uh, for every uh, uh, one degree off at... Uh, for at 60 miles, is it, uh, yeah, if just one degree off, if you're walking, let's say, uh, you want to go from point A to B, and point B is uh, 60 miles away, and you're just one degree off, uh, you'll miss it by a, a mile, all right? Now, multiply that 60 miles, or take 93 million miles and divide it by 60, and what would you have if it's just one degree off? Well, I just did the math, and if you're just one degree off of parallel facing the Earth, the by the time, since we're 93 million miles away, that light beam, all right, just one degree off of parallel from the Earth, which we just slightly off of wherever we are, center of the sun, would be would miss the Earth by 1,550,000 miles. And when my cat lays a fresh turd out, Donald Trump can't smell it. That's the relevance of your point. There is so much light being emitted from the sun at every conceivable angle that the light can be thought of as being spread out uniformly over the surface of a sphere. As such, it follows the inverse square law. And yet they have at the top of the sun and the bottom of the sun these rays crisscrossing all of a sudden to cr create the umbra penumbra. So only something like this would ever strike the earth. Your level of understanding here, Rich, is so wrong that you might as well be trying to catch a fish with a pencil. You'd be more successful. Makes sense. So in reality, it doesn't matter how big or, or small or far away, since it's 93 million miles, I guess, uh, you have to say that it, the exact size of the Earth is the only light rays we see, which means it's the same size, because all these other angles are going other ways. We'll never strike the Earth. We'd never see it. No way around it. So again, this is what we should see and what we've been doing. All right, this is how science shows it, except they show it a little different. Let's see how they show it. All of a sudden, see, this is this is how you would actually see the rays. They, they would come off at the different angles, never strike the Earth. Sorry, is this supposed to be a diagram of the sun, Earth, and moon? If so, everything is grossly out of scale, completely wrong. All right. Now they have them on top here. Instead of going up like this, they come down and they create this little 70-mile 
shadow across the Earth, right? So if the rays were truly parallel, you'd have this 2,100 roughly mile shadow during a solar eclipse. But they have to show it this way so that we get a little 70 mile eclipse. Okay, not the parallel like just flashed up there for a second. So, Rich, why would you not have those diagonal lines coming from the top and the bottom of the sun? If you can see the top and the bottom of the sun, that means there's light coming from those areas. Let's, uh, let's continue. Here's another way they show it. This is a diagram from the, uh, how they were showing the eclipse, the great American eclipse of 2017. See, they have, have to have rays that are actually should be going up in this direction, coming down and making a very small shadow on the Earth. Sorry if my dog barking got in there. Ha! <laughs> Even the dog's trying to tell him he's chatting plop. Brilliant. Either way, we know your argument. It's getting old. Please move on. And here's the Earth. Wow, what kind of shadow do you think that would cast on the moon if it was blocking the sun? I mean, there's the arc we should see. The size of the arc of the shadow on the Earth, right? I mean, on the moon during a lunar eclipse. Let's look at actual eclipses and see what we see. And remember, because the sun is far away and we get these crisscrossing solar rays, we get a smaller shadow. So when you reverse it, it's still the same distances. You just put the uh, Earth in front of the moon. Uh, the Earth should be casting a smaller shadow than even this. Well, let's take a look at an eclipse. Here's an eclipse, and uh, this part right here is the Earth's shadow, right? We're going to see it before it turns colors also, because people will argue, oh, no, you got to look at it the other way, Rich. I'll tell you, cognitive dissonance just kills everybody. So I did a little arc here to match it up, right? See how it matches there? No, I can see how it doesn't match whatsoever. Nowhere near. And that's, let's see the size. There's the size. <laughs> size of the Earth. How come it's not smaller? Look at that. And uh, I squeeze it down a little bit because I do have it a little bit elongated. Move it over. And it matches pretty well. really does. Oh my word, are you blind? It doesn't match at all. So we have the Earth isn't casting a smaller shadow, but the Moon does. Should be no difference. The difference is, Rich, that the moon is smaller than the Earth. It's not hard at all, buddy. Really should be. And from that picture of the Earth in Apollo's picture, does this look like the size of the shadow should be cast? Hmm. I think not. No, because that picture from Apollo isn't the moon causing a shadow on the Earth. It's the Earth in phase, much like you would see the moon in a phase here on Earth. So here is a uh, time-lapse photography of a lunar eclipse in 2017. And let's watch the shadow come across. All right, it gets a little bit better to find as it gets further. Notice this, right? I'm going to go back. Notice this oscillation. We always see this oscillation in eclipses. So I always say, I guess the Earth is jumping back and forth in space. Anyway, I get to the point where it's really dark so we can... Do another little arc to see how it should work. There we go. And now there's no yellow. There's no umber penumbra mixing here. We just have the Earth shadow, right? Look how look at the arc of that. All right. Now let's put the, put it on. Look how big that is. Unreal. Earth doesn't get smaller, but the Moon does, huh? That is a huge circle. Well, yes, but it's still smaller than the Earth. The Moon is four times smaller than the Earth. That shadow is not four times bigger than the Moon. Small shadow. At this point, I'd like to show you a small clip about lunar eclipses, which rips to shreds the Flat Earth theory, as well as proving the globe. It's from Joss Lays. Hold on to your Marmite jar, Rich, because this is going to hurt.
game over. Can't see him coming back from that. I don't get it though. Mr. Thrive and Survive seems to misunderstand eclipses video after video after video after video, yet he still comes back for more. Right, that wraps up another episode of Flat Earth Friday. Thank you very much for joining me. If you liked it, please do drop a like and subscribe as well. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great weekend, and I'll see you all on Tuesday for something entirely new. Until then.